Hi everybody. Today I am reporting to you from the classroom. So I came in today with the boys. Came in yesterday too, but hi boys. Can you wave to my class? Hello. So chairs are up. I have some things covered just in case um, they do any of the cleaning that like, you know how they fog the room or whatever, it makes my papers curly sometimes. Also, this place is super dusty, so I figure if I can cover stuff up, maybe I can forego some of the dust. I know that's a lofty thought. Um, I already posted a new assignment to Google Classroom. It is a short Pixar film. So it's like, excuse me, a little bit over four minutes long. No words, you have to pay attention. Um, I love Pixar shorts. There are a bunch of them out there, and if you guys like that activity, I think I'll keep going with that. Um, so today there were three things that you had to do. Gosh, I did that this morning. It feels like so long ago. Um, you needed to sequence events, cause and effect, and I think character traits. It was a really cute one. The kids and I watched it. They liked it too, and we talked about it. So go ahead and get on there. I wanted to tell you guys, whenever you do your Google Classroom, um, it's weird because I feel like I'm talking to you guys because I see your desks, but you're not there. Anyway, um, whenever you do your Google Classroom assignments, it's just like whenever we would be sitting here in the classroom and I would be on your assignment and you'd be at your desk and we would know that we were on the same document together and then um, you would just hit the turn in button. You don't have to email it to me or hit share. You don't have to hit share. You're just going to turn it in to me because whatever work you do in that document, I see your work. Even if you don't hit share and you don't hit turn in, I'll actually see it. Okay. So if you're not sure or you forget or somehow your brain oozed out of your ear and you forgot, just do your work in there and then leave it alone because I'll still be able to see it. It just won't say turned in. Okay. Um, I know that my homeroom has been talking to each other on the Google Classroom um, stream. You know how like, it's kind of like a post, you can see everything. They, they're actually talking and commenting to each other. I have comments turned on. So Ms. Boker's homeroom, you guys can say hi to each other on there if you want to. I don't want you to do it a million times and then the whole stream, you can't find my assignment. But if you want to say hi to each other, do it. I think it's pretty cute. Okay, so on to the business of the day. Chapter 25. Okay. <clears throat> OMG, what a night. I still can't believe how everything turned out once the championship round began. That's when Mr. Kinsley explained. The questions this time will be a bit more difficult. Scoring, however, will be the same. The team with the best score out of 100 possible points will be our champion. He picked up the cards that contain the quiz questions and smiled. Here is question number one. What is diplopia? I might have said that wrong. I don't know. A. Double vision. B. Left handedness. C. A disease of the gums. D. A form of cancer. Oh boy, he wasn't kidding. This was going to be a killer round. I was sure the answer was A, though, kind of. Then the answer was revealed. Double vision was correct. Whew. Rose, Connor, and I got it right. Claire missed it. Everyone on the Perry Valley team answered it correctly. The score was three to four. Number two, Mr. Kingsley said. Who is the composer of Rhapsody in Blue? A, Mozart. B, Gershwin. C, Copeland. D, Beethoven. Bing, 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 bing. Thanks to my parents and Mrs. V, that was, an, that was a little easier. I pushed the button for B. One person on the Perry Valley team got it wrong, and Claire must, messed up as well. That made the score six to seven. With Perry Valley ahead, everybody could feel the tension. The next 20 questions covered things like lions in the jungle, gravity in space, authors of famous books, and math. Some of those I even got right. Bing, 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 bing. Even though Connor aced a hard spelling problem and Claire came through on a difficult history, history question, 
Harry Valley kept staying one or two points ahead of us. It was getting near the end of the round. Harry Valley had surged ahead on a math question and was up by three points. It looked pretty grim for us. With a score of 78 to 81, I glanced at Connor. Sweat dripped from his nose. Then Mr. Kingsley asked, the condition in which a person may be able to hear colors or visualize flavors when music is played is called A. Synthesis B. Symbiosis C. Synesthesia D. Symbolism I grinned and punched in C. Not only was it one of Mrs. B's vocabulary words, it was me! I breathed a sigh of relief when I realized that Connor and Claire and Rose had also chosen the right answer. When the results were tallied, only one of the Perry Valley kids had gotten it right. Math people, so what's the score? The score stood at 82 to 82. It was time for the very last question. This one would determine the group that would go to Washington. I glanced at Rose and the others. I think we all gulped at the same time. Our last question of the evening, Mr. Kingsley began, is a math mathematics problem. I groaned inside. There goes our trip to Washington. I may as well go back to room H5 and hide there for the rest of a thousand years, or for the next thousand years. Number 25, Mr. Kingsley said slowly. Lisa gets up every morning and gets ready for school. She takes 22 minutes to get dressed. 18 minutes to eat breakfast, and 10 minutes to walk to school. What time should Lisa get up so she can arrive at school at 7.25 a.m.? A, 6.15. B, 6.20. C, 6.25. D, 6.35. I need to add, then subtract. How do I subtract time? I need to set a clock. I'm getting all mixed up. Time is running out. I can't mess up now. It could have been C, but it might have been D. I thought a moment more, then I pushed D, feeling like I was going to throw up. The answers lit up on the screen. Everybody on our team had answered D. Either we were all correct or all really terrible at figuring out time problems. Three students on the Perry Valley team had answered D. One of them had answered C. Well, it looks like we have a winner, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely pleased to announce that the team that will represent us in Washington, D.C. this year, the team we hope to see go on Good Morning America with a score of 86 to 85 is... He paused for effect. Spalding Street Elementary School. I couldn't help it. I squealed. I kicked. My arms jerked crazily. I tried really hard to control it, but I just couldn't help it. My body went a little wacko on me. Shut her up, I heard Claire hiss. Shh, Rose whispered through clenched teeth. Thank you for watching our telecast, Mr. Kingsley said, throwing a quick glance at me. Please join us in two weeks when we televise the finals from Washington. This is Charles Kingsley. Good night. He signaled that we had finished. The cameras blinked to dark and the lights blessedly clicked off. I couldn't stop kicking. My arms acted like wound up, wind up toys, gone bananas. I screamed with joy. At least nobody noticed this time because hoops and hollers abounded as dozens of people stormed the stage. Dad balanced Penny on one arm and a camcorder on the other. Mom, Catherine, and Mrs. V rushed over to me and almost smothered me with hugs. Mrs. V tried to look as if she weren't surprised, but her grin seemed to be permanently attached. Mr. Deming, the alternates, and all the parents of the rest of the kids on the team cheered and jumped and patted one another on the back. One of the parents streamed confetti over us. Balloons appeared from nowhere. Somebody in the studio turned the speakers up loudly and played the song, Celebration. People started to, glance, to dance. It seemed as if a million pictures were taken. Amazingly, lots were being taken of me. I did my best to calm down and relax. Smile, Melody, called a guy with a baseball cap. Click, flash. Can somebody sit her up a little straighter in her chair? Click, flash. Get a picture of the kid in the wheelchair. I think that guy was a reporter. Click, flash. Where's the winning team? Another reporter asked loudly. We want a team picture for the newspaper. Why don't you kids stand around Melody? Okay now, smile. Click, flash. 
I could barely see. Blue dots danced in front of my eyes. We want the winning team for a TV interview, someone else called out. Can we have them over here? People, people were shuffled around and a stagehand helped us set up. Connor, Rose, and Claire sat in chairs next to me. Amanda, Molly, Alina, and Rodney stood behind us. Mr. Deming stood next to Rodney. I hoped that my hair looked okay and that I wouldn't look too goofy. The reporter silenced the crowd as the cameraman lined up and got into position. Good evening. This is Elizabeth Okoa of Channel 6 News. I'm here in our studio as we speak to students from Spalding Street Elementary School, victorious members of the winning team of the Wiz Kids competition held here tonight. These are eight of the brightest young people in our community who buzzed their way to victory tonight. Let's meet them. We'll start with the alternates in the back row. The, youngst the youngsters who will fill in should one of the team members not be able to participate. Please tell me your names and ages. She asked as she put the microphone in front of each student. Amanda Firestone, age 12. Molly North, age 11. Alina Rodriguez, age 12. Rodney Mosel, age 11 and a half. That got a laugh. Miss Okoa continued, and seated in front of me is the championship team. Please tell me your names as well. My name is Claire Wilson, and I'm 11, and I got more right than anyone else on my team. Good for you, Miss Okoa said. I know you studied hard for this. The reporter moved quickly to Rose. And you are Rose Spencer, age 11, Rose said, sounding shy. What stands out for you this evening? The reporter asked as the camera moved in closer. I was on last year's team and we lost by only a few points. So it's real exciting to win this time. I'm very proud of our team. Rose was beaming. Great answer. And we're proud of you as well, Miss Okoa said. And now to this tall young man, your name, sir? She asked Connor. Connor Bates, hi, mom. Connor spoke loudly into the mic. Do you remember the hardest question you were given tonight? The reporter asked him. I thought all the questions were super easy, Connor said with a grin. I missed a few on purpose so the other contestants wouldn't feel bad. Miss Okoa burst into a tinkly laugh. How does it feel to be on a team with your very special team member? She asked. Hey, Melody is okay. She's really smart. Let me introduce you to... But I wasn't about to let him steal my thunder. My name is Melody Brooks and I'm 11 years old. My machine said loudly and clearly. The reporter looked amazed. Well, this is astounding. How does it feel to be part of the winning team, Melody? I pressed my key for... Super! She laughed. Was it difficult to study and pressure pressure. Was it difficult to study and prepare for the competition? Miss Okoa asked. No, lots of people helped me. What was the hardest part about participating tonight? Hoping I wouldn't mess up. She smiled. We all feel like that sometimes. Are you excited about traveling to Washington, D.C.? Oh, yes. Have you ever been there before? No. How will being on the winning team change your life at school? I thought that was a good question. Not much, I admitted. Then the reporter waited patiently while I took the time to tap the right words. Maybe kids will talk to me more. I talk to her all the time, Claire interjected. Both Rose and Connor looked at her with frowns. Huh? Miss Okoa moved away from me and over to Claire. So you consider yourself to be Melody's friend? Oh, absolutely, Claire said with a bounce of her cinnamon colored curls. She and I eat lunch together every day and test each other on questions for the quiz team. Melody is a lot smarter than she looks. Rose raised her hand to speak, but the reporter shook her head. I'm so sorry, but we're out of time, she told Rose. To the camera, she said, in addition to a great group of kids, we've just met two remarkable young women, best friends in spite of their differences and members of the winning team, or winning Washington bound whiz, quit, whiz kids team. Congrats to you all. I was stunned. Claire? What do you think about that? Chapter 26. In the midst of all the commotion, Mr. Deming seemed to get an inspiration. Let's go out to dinner to celebrate, he announced as the last of the studio lights were turned off. Great idea, Connor said immediately. I'm starving, said Amanda. Even though I wasn't on camera, I've been too nervous to eat all day. 
Me too, Alina added. How about linguinis? Connor suggested. They've got all you can eat spaghetti. Leave it to Connor to know all the best places to eat. They might go out of business after you show up, Connor, Mr. Deming said with a laugh. Don't go embarrassing me now. Don't worry, Mr. D. My max is about 12 bowls of spaghetti. Linguinis is perfect, Rose's dad said. It's walking distance, just around the corner from the studio. These kids deserve a special night out. I looked at Mom, not sure if this was a good idea. Then Alina walked over to me and said, You'll come too, won't you, Melanie? Yeah, Melanie, Rose added. Come with us. You did really great tonight. We couldn't have won without you, Connor said, as he buttoned up his coat. Their words made me feel like one of the helium balloons that some families had bought. Well, I wouldn't go that far, Melody said. <coughs> Sorry. Well, I wouldn't go that far, Molly said, glancing at Claire. Balloons do pop. You weren't up there, Connor reminded Molly. So you coming or not, Rose asked. Sure, I tapped. It will be fun. I glanced at Mom again, who nodded. Dad took Penny home, and Mrs. V gave me a hug and promised she'd see me in the morning. The air was brisk and the conversation silly as we headed for the restaurant. How many windows do you think are in that office building? Connor shouted, pointing to the tallest one we could see. 5,274, Rose answered. Man, you're good, Rodney said. How did you know that? How do you think I got on the quiz team, Rose told him. We've got smarts. She's just guessing, Molly told Rodney. You believe anything. The restaurant had been in the location for years. The outside entrance was designed to look like a bistro from a small Italian village. Painted grape leaves and tiny white lights decorated the bricks around the door. The door. When Connor's dad opened it for everyone to enter, Connor and Rodney bounced up the, or bounded up the steps. The steps. Five stone steps led upstairs to the dining area. Everyone, including Mr. Deming, rushed past me and Mom. Finally, Connor's dad, the last to go up, looked at me, looked at the stairs, and the light bulb came on. Oh, do you need me, or do you need some help? He asked. He was large like his son. I bet he could swallow a few bowls of pasta as well. Mom replied, would you be so kind as to ask an employee where their wheelchair ramp is located? As if glad to have something to do, Mr. Bates dashed up the stairs. Mom and I sat there in the cold, alone. A waiter dressed in black rushed down the moments later. I'm so sorry, we have an elevator in the back, but it went on the fritz this afternoon. The technician is coming to fix it first thing in the morning. That's not going to help us tonight, is it? Mom told him. Her voice was tight, but not angry. I'd be glad to help you carry her up the steps, he offered. No, I tapped. My eyes begged Mom. Mom told him, just hold the door for us, young man. We'll be fine. He did just that. Mom turned her back to the stairs, got a good grip on my chair, tilted it back slightly, and took a deep breath. I was so glad we had decided on the manual chair this morning. Mom gently rolled the back wheels up the edge of the first stone step. Pull, roll up, bump, first step. Pull, roll up, bump, second step. Roll, or pull, roll up, bump, third step. She paused and took another breath. We'd done this before many times. Pull, roll up, bump, fourth step. Pull, roll up, bump, fifth step. Then we finally rolled into the dining room, which was crowded with noisy, laughing customers. Over here, Melody, Mr. Deming called as he saw us. Mom led me over to our very large table, and I was relieved to see that the group had left a spot for me. With all the kids on the team, plus their parents, we took, we took up a big chunk of the table space in the place. In some restaurants, the tables are too low for my chair, but this time I was able to slide perfectly into place. Mom helped me take off my coat, then sat in the seat next to me. She gulped the water from her glass and asked for a refill. The waitress began to take orders. Rodney and his parents ordered a large mushroom and onion pizza. We're vegetarians, Rodney explained. I had no idea. Can I get a steak, Dad? Connor asked. His dad clapped him on the back. Sure, I'll think I'll have one myself. For this one night, you get anything you want. Connor's eyes got large. 
a whole chocolate cake? You'll barf, boy, his dad replied. I want the pasta delight, Rose told the waitress, with extra teas. Me too, said Amanda. May I have the spaghetti and meatballs, please? Alina asked. Claire and Molly both ordered lasagna. When the waitress got to me and Mom, I was ready. I'll have mac and cheese, please, I made Elvira say. The waitress looked a little surprised, since most of the machine was tucked under the table, but she was cool and acted as if she got orders from Medi Talkers every day. Sure, hun, coming right up. You want some salad with that? No, thanks. She gave me a big, bright smile, then took Mom's order. Only my mom would order baked fish at an Italian restaurant. As we waited for our food, the cheerf cheerful mood continued. Our tables were covered with white paper instead of tablecloths, so everybody, including the adults, had been given crayons and markers. Look at this. I drew a, drew a giant monster rabbit, Connor said. He glanced at Rose's drawing, then added large green teeth to his own. And it's going to eat that wimpy bug you just drew, he told her. Rose laughed. Well, this is a poisonous spider, and it's going to bite your silly old rabbit. Rodney and Connor then lined up all the salt and pepper shakers and started tossing sugar packets over the barricade with forks and spoons as catapults. But I noticed that Claire, who was sitting next to Rodney, was strangely quiet and didn't even pick up a crayon. Engage the enemy, Connor cried. Score! You weren't even in my territory, man. Besides, you tossed the pink fake sugar stuff. You only get half a point for that stuff. I sat and watched my teammates do such ordinary things. Drawing, laughing, teasing, joking. I really tried hard to look like I was having fun, too. But all I wanted to do was go home. When the waitress finally brought the food, forks became important for eating, and the war ended and suddenly ended suddenly sorry conversation slowed down as everybody dug into their meals connor took a huge bite of his steak mm, this is the bomb he said with his mouth full mom's fish looked a little well fishy as she picked at it with her fork she and i were thinking the same thing i knew my food sat untouched in front of me our family goes out to restaurants every once in a while Actually, Penny is more of a problem in a restaurant than I am because she's wiggly and excitable and she's likely to throw her peas on the floor. Usually eating out doesn't bother me. Mom and Dad take turns spooning food into my mouth and I ignore everyone who is rude enough to stare. But this was different. At school, I eat in a special area of the cafeteria with the other disabled kids. The aides put bibs on us, feed us, and wipe our mouths when we're done. With the exception of that sip of Coke at the competition, nobody on the team had ever really seen me eat, rather be fed. I didn't know what to do. My food sat there getting cold. I looked at mom. She looked at me. She picked up the spoon and looked at me with a question on her face. I nodded. Very carefully, she placed a spoonful of pasta in my mouth. I swallowed. I did not spill. I saw Molly poke Claire and they exchanged looks. Mom spooned one more portion into my mouth. I swallowed. It did not spill. We continued, one spoonful at a time. My phone's ringing, seriously. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. I was so hungry. Just like every day. I was so hungry. Nobody said anything but I saw them look down at their plates with way too much attention. It got quiet. Even Connor stopped talking. Finally, even though my plate was still full, I pushed it away. Would you like to take this home, Melody? Mom whispered. I nodded yes, hugely relieved, and she signaled for the waitress, who also brought dessert menus. Being reminded of cake and ice cream cheered up Connor, who did not order a whole chocolate cake, but did order two slices. Rodney ordered apple pie while Rose asked for pudding. Claire ended up taking her food home in a box as well. She had eaten almost nothing and barely said two words all evening. So what did you think about the final question? That was too hard, Rodney said. Piece of cake, Connor replied, laughing at his own joke. He smeared whipped cream over his second piece of cake. Did you see the hair on that announcer? Amanda teased. It never moved. 
Must have been made of plastic, Rose said, laughing. What are you wearing to the DC competition? Rose asked Claire. Claire just shrugged. I wonder if we'll get to visit the White House while we're there, Amanda mused. That would be awesome. I believe it's on our agenda for Saturday, Mr. Deming replied enthusiastically. I'm excited about that as well. So what's with you and Melody being best friends, Claire? Alina asked. Hey. Hold on, guys. 